here we are back again. Um, this is Senate Government Operations. It is still Wednesday, our Friday, uh, February 18th. And we are jumping now to S-171, which is the um, <coughs> ethics, uh, the creation of an, a state code of ethics. And I wanna, <coughs> I sent out um, a bunch of notes to people. And I don't know if we have a, a new draft or to address, okay. And so I, I do um, want to say that um, the, I've, I've gotten tons of emails about passing a code of ethics that applies to everyone. And, and I think that that is exactly, um, I mean, I, I don't think we have any concerns about having everybody act ethically. My, my main concern was in some of the detail of how, how um, the procedures were, not the code itself, but the actions that were to follow. And specifically, my concern uh, was around the conflict of interest, uh, not, not about the, the conflict of interest statement itself and what that meant and that we should avoid conflict of interest or the appearance of conflict of interest, but around the procedure that was established that was so in detail that see, and I think that that's where I heard um, attorneys and the judiciary and the general assembly members having issues, not with the concept itself, but with the details about how you had to, the actions you had to take. So. I just wanted to make it clear that I don't think anybody has, has any concerns about having a general code of ethics that we all have to live by. It's the details of how you care, how, what you do when there's an issue or how you respond to it. Does that make any sense to anybody at all? Yes. Because <laughs> I've been very, very concerned that, um, and so I, Amarin, did do we have, and I apologize, but I have not had a minute to even, oh, there it is. Oh, no, no, that's optometry. If you check your email, Madam Chair, at about 11.39 this morning, Amarin sent out the uh, draft. Got it. Thank you so much. I have not even had a chance to look at my email. Is uh, Brian, is that the same that's on our website here? That's yes, it is. it is. It is. Either okay. Way. Thanks. And I, I just like to say, as we begin this, I really appreciate the amount of time everybody's put into this, especially our chair and Christina, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> uh, Jeanette, you've worked really hard to try and get us to guess on this. And I know Christina has as well. So I, I just, as, at the onset of this conversation, I just want to <laughs> acknowledge your efforts on uh, moving us forward. So just... Um, before we start here, I'm going to do one thing. Something happens sometimes to my um, camera and I can't, if I try to go someplace else, it makes all my Zoom things go away. I mean, all my, so I'm going to go away. <laughs> I guess she meant it. Yeah. <laughs> Fair uh, warning. Well, yeah, she gave us about a two second warning. She'll be back. How long should we wait? You don't uh, have to. Thank you. I apologize for that. Oh, Sometimes you. when I go to look at something else it just makes you all go away well are we back back huh are we back you are well i i went out and came back so yeah you're okay. back all right no, and, and um it's bad enough not being able to be there in person with you and it's really bad if i can't even be there on zoom with you so okay so i am going to ask 
Amron, and I hate really, um, you know how much I hate share, screen sharing, <laughs> but I have not had the opportunity to look and I don't want to try and find it again because I'll just get kicked out again. And um, for, so I'm going to ask Amron to share her screen with us on this new, new um, draft, and then we will um, take testimony on the new draft. Is that okay with everybody? And I see we <coughs> have Paul, thank you um, <coughs> for joining us. Anthony told us you were going to, so thank you. And um, Jason and John Campbell and Vince Aluzzi we have with us in addition to all our usual players. So I will, um, for the benefit of those of you who don't know all of us, I keep forgetting that some of you aren't with us all the time. We'll introduce ourselves and then we'll have Amarin jump on. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. Hi, I'm Anthony Polina, Washington County. Brian Collimore, Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Nisha Ram Hinsdale, Chittenden County. Senator Rom Hinsdale is in the middle of some kind of an ice and wind storm and is having trouble with her connection. So she's leaving her camera off. <coughs> um, <coughs> so Amron, do you want to um, start us off on this? Sure, for the record, Amron Averjali, Legislative Council. I will share my screen. Thank you. All right, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. Great. And just, I will say that um, this, these um, recommended changes, I don't know how much Amron put in there, what I sent and what other people sent, but this is not, these are not suggested changes necessarily by the committee, but um, I, I sent a whole bunch of suggested changes and I know Christina sent some to Amron also, so. I think it's a combination of those. Yes. Uh, so uh, for everyone watching, I am looking at draft number 1.1 of S171, um, noted as a markup with today's date, February 18th. This is a strike all amendment that you have seen before with updated language, which is noted in yellow highlight. The uh, the new language in here is a combination of some suggestions from Senator White, as well as some suggestions from um, the Ethics Commission. And so I will, unless anyone would like me to uh, go into more detail, I will just sort of scroll from highlight to highlight yeah. um, and give you some context. So you'll see here on the first page that conflict of interest has been deleted. This is because it is being added later within the bill. And then there's renumbering happening on page two into page three and four. And then you'll see the next set of changes begin at the bottom of page four. I've removed the word exclusions from the title and you'll see the applicability section, the first section and second session section <clears throat> um, are similar to the language you've seen before, but there are some changes to this subdivision two on page five. Um, so this would, with these changes, this would read the code of ethics established by this section does not prohibit branches of state government agencies or, or departments from adopting additional provisions regarding the ethical conduct of their employees or provisions which exceed the requirements of this code of conduct. Um, I would say make a note on this section to think about how this language reads with some of the changes you see later and where how you would like this section to read. Um, so I will just note that for now and I will mention it later when we get to that point. Uh, this removes all of uh, subsection B, the exclusions. And now moving on to page six, there is a fairly significant change to section 1203 conflict of interest. I've added in appearance of conflict of interest. 
This would now read subsection A, conflict of interest, appearance of conflict of interest in the public servant's official capacity, the public servant shall avoid any conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. The appearance of a conflict shall be determined from the perspective of a reasonable individual with knowledge of the relevant facts. Two, uh, as used in this section, and here you, you will see the definition of conflict of interest has moved um, from the definition section up at the top of the bill down into this section. So as used in this section, conflict of interest means a direct or indirect interest of a public servant or such an interest known to the public servant of a member of the public servant's immediate family or household or of a business associate in the outcome of a particular matter pending before the public servant or the public servant's public body, or that is in conflict with the proper discharge of the public servant's duties. Conflict of interest does not include any interest that is not greater than that of other individuals generally affected by, excuse me, affected by the outcome of a matter. So the next, excuse me, significant change is under uh, subsection B, course of action. There is a new subdivision one, legislative branch, a public servant of the legislative branch shall comply with applicable legislative branch rules and policies regarding the course of action a public servant may take when confronted with a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. Similarly, moving now into page seven, uh, subdivision two, judicial branch, a public servant of the judicial branch shall comply with applicable judicial branch code of conduct rules and policies regarding the course of action a public servant may take when confronted with a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. Subdivision three is specific to government attorneys and others in licensed professions. A public servant who is a licensed attorney shall comply with the Vermont Rules of Professional Conduct regarding the course of action the attorney may take when confronted with a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. A public servant working in any other licensed profession shall comply with the rules of the licensing entity regarding the course of action the public servant may take when confronted with a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. Subdivision four, um, and now we get into language that will look more familiar to you from the uh, the previous draft, uh, public servants, other, any public servant not covered by subdivisions one through three of this section shall comply with requirements prescribed in this subdivision B4. Each time a public servant is confronted with a conflict of interest other than that for which the public servant's action is solely ministerial or clerical, the public servant shall either make a public statement which may consist of a statement made to the public servant's immediate supervisor, recusing themselves from the matter, or if the public servant chooses to proceed with the matter, prepare a written statement regarding the nature of the conflict. Um, and then you'll see later in here, I moved up a previous uh, subsection uh, in the instance of recusal. Once recused, a public servant shall not in any way participate in or act to influence a decision regarding this matter. And then it goes into if the public servant chooses to proceed, and then um, you'll go through the written statement requirements. And then there's a redesignation um, of the good cause subsection, a removal. I'm now on page nine of uh, subdivision two, the action to be taken is ministerial or clerical because that phrase was added up above. You'll see the deletion of conduct after recusal. That is another item I moved further up above. And then there is a new subsection D, confidential information. Nothing in this section shall require a public servant to disclose confidential information or information that is otherwise privileged under law. There is a, uh, a couple of changes to section uh, 1203B, appearance of unethical conduct, which I will note uh, is, is beyond just uh, appearance of a conflict of interest. This would cover conflict of interest as well as any other type of uh, unethical conduct. So a public servant shall avoid any actions creating the appearance that the public servant is violating the code of ethics, whether particular circumstances create an appearance that the code of ethics have been violated shall be determined from the perspective of a reasonable individual with knowledge of the relevant facts. That was a requested change from the ethics commission. So I will leave the uh, reasoning for that for uh, witness testimony. Moving down into page 10, um, section 1203F, 
Um, this gray language was language that was highlighted. Um, Senator White in a comment about whether to have this language in this section, uh, the Ethics Commission would like to keep this in this section. So I have just flagged it for the moment for further committee discussion. Then you have uh, section 1203G gifts. These are unchanged. I'm moving now into page 12 and then into page 13 and 14. <clears throat> You'll see uh, in subsection B, this is the section about how to value the uh, the value of gifts, either the value or the cost of a gift. In limits, I have changed the de minimis gift amount from $20 to $25. This is sort of a, a combined comments from Senator White as well as from the Ethics Commission. And then moving down into page 16. Uh, right now we are, let me scroll back for a moment, just so you can orient yourselves. We're now in section 1203I, employment restrictions, subsection B, post-government employment. You'll see subdivisions one and two are a restatement of the current laws that apply to legislators and executive officers. Subdivision three is regarding legislative branch employees. Uh, the, you'll see most of the language from the current draft is being taken out. And then there is some new additional language that is uh, suggested by the Ethics Commission. So this would read, except as permitted in subdivision four of this subsection, for one year after leaving office, a former legislative branch employee may not, for compensation, appear before the General Assembly or its subparts, or the office in which the employee served at the time of leaving service to advocate for anyone other than the state concerning any matter in which the state has a direct and substantial interest. I did include a question here about uh, the, the scope of employees that this would cover. Um, as you know, there are interns as well as clerks that work uh, both at the Office of Legislative Council as well as for um, each of the chambers at times. So <clears throat> I, I was not sure what you wanted me to uh, put or not put for those individuals. So I left that as a question. Uh, Subdivision five, representation restrictions. You'll see the current language that's in the draft is being removed um, all the way down through page 17. And then following this, there is a uh, new language that is suggested by the Ethics Commission. After leaving state service or employment, a public servant shall not knowingly with the intent to influence the outcome of an investigation, application, ruling, license, contract, claim, rulemaking, charge, arrest, quasi-judicial or judicial proceeding, communicate with or appear before the state on matters involving specific parties in which the employee participated personally and substantially during government service and in which the state is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. Moving down now into uh, page 18, looking at section 1205, mandatory ethics, education and training. A public, uh, a public servant shall participate in continuing ethics education, which may be in person or online at least once every three years thereafter. Approved continuing ethics education providers are the State Ethics Commission, the Department of Human Resources Center for Achievement in Public Service, also known as CAPS, the Vermont House of Representative Ethics Panel for the House of Representatives, the Vermont State Ethics Panel for the Senate, um, the new edition here of state licensing entities, and then any education providers approved by the State Ethics Commission. And that is all of the changes. Thank you, Amran. <clears throat> so if, if I might just um, add something here before we go. I suggested taking the, the conflict of interest um, definition out of the definitions and instead putting it there with everything else because that's what we've done with all of the other other ethical 12 rules or whatever we're calling them so that it it is there and and 
I also suggested because what I thought I heard from people and maybe maybe I'm wrong was under that code of ethic, I mean, under that conflict of interest policy that the <clears throat> legislative branch will determine the process that the legislator or the uh, branch employee goes through when there's been a conflict and the same, the judiciary will determine how they, the process that they use and that um, attorneys will use their process. So it wasn't meant to, instead of saying, but this doesn't apply to have it there and then say, but this doesn't apply to those. It made more sense to me to put it in a positive way and say, they already have procedures for how to, how to deal with conflict of interest. And so they will use their own procedures as opposed, and then the, all the, I think it said public servants other, I think that was Christina, was that you and Amron that came up with that word? Okay, Amron. So <clears throat> anybody who isn't covered under those others, then that's the procedure that they would use. So I um, <clears throat> apologize if that didn't answer what I thought we heard a lot from the attorneys and the judiciary and <clears throat> um, other people, but that, that was, that was why I did that. And um, there was one other one that Amron said, oh, the, <laughs> the um, where I suggested taking out, oh, use of government resources. I had suggested taking out that whole language because it seemed unnecessary to me. You can't misuse government resources, but I, I don't have a, strong feeling about that. So that, that I just wanted to explain kind of how, and, and I really appreciated um, Christina's uh, rewrite of that language about the post, the po post employment, um, post service employment for both legislative branch employees and for others, because I think it wasn't clear enough that it applied, that, you had to have been involved in that particular case personally and substantially before. And, and that seems to me to make sense that you should, not, you should not be doing that. But I think that was unclear. And I think we heard a lot of, a lot of concern and com, um, comments about that. So I just wanted to explain <clears throat> kind of my thinking in here and appreciating Christina's um, willingness to to bear with me. So with that uh, committee members, does anybody have any questions about the redraft and what, where it is and what it says? Yes, there, Allison. I, I, I think this is, uh, uh, this is good. I think this answers much of what we've heard. I, uh, I said earlier, that I really appreciate the work you and Christina have put into this to uh, to respond to the concerns of the committee and to your concern. I mean, I, I think you've done a lot of work and I'm grateful because uh, you've done it on our behalf and we're this is really moving us forward. Uh, I um, And I think I have some concern about interns and clerks that I'd like yeah. us to also address. I, I do have some concerns about government resources. I think that is... I think they can be abused and um, I have a vivid imagination, I guess, but you know, all of us, and I think it's one, a common concern and complaint that people see people taking advantage of a resource that is available in moderation for your use, but not in gross amounts. So I, I, I can think of many ways that government resources could be uh, misused by by people, and so I'm sort of I'm, I'm a little surprised that got taken out. But no, no, it didn't get taken out. Only the I thought you said no. I, I can't find. I mean, I'm having a hard time finding. No, it them. didn't get taken out. The only thing that got taken out was oh, here a, it is. A, yeah. a pair of a section that said unless it's been approved before. It still says right. okay, you can't got it. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Oh no, I would never take that out. Yeah, because I <clears throat> I think that's a source yeah. of much uh, complaint. So I think that, um, so let's, 
unless there's other questions about the drafting or about this from the committee members, let's jump to um, hear what people think. And <clears throat> um, I think that we will start with, because uh, we had a lot of concerns from the judiciary, so I think we'll start with Scott. Good afternoon. Hello, Senator and committee members. Uh, for the record, Scott Griffith, interim state court administrator for the judiciary, the Vermont judiciary. And uh, I just want to echo what has been said by Senator Clarkson and you, Senator White. Uh, there's a lot of work that's going into this. I, let me also say that I'm just seeing it. So I, 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 whatever I have to offer is in the moment without having spoken mm -hmm. to any of my colleagues or, or any other folks. But um, thank you to the committee for recognizing the the um, the 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 interest that we have in in uh, having our constitutional authority, if not our obligations, um, uh, recognized. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, there's a lot to lot to like here. I want to make sure I'm clear about something. Uh, the it looks like the on uh, page six and seven in the conflict of interest section, there is a an exception made for under the course of action section, legislative branch, judicial branch, and attorneys and licensed professions. You've got that other category. And then beginning on page nine in 1203A, the provisions in the bill from 1203A, I think through J, those are things are those things, Senator White, that uh, that were talked about at last Friday's committee discussion as the the Boy Scout ten points or ten to twelve points, and is it is it is it the 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 is it correct to how should I read this? Are these things that will apply to public servants, including uh, those in the in the judicial branch? as outlined here, or are these things that, that the branch will be expected to incorporate if they don't exist already uh, into our existing codes? I, I, I don't think that you'd be expected to, I, I don't have it in front of me now because as I said, I'll, I'll lose you, but I think that you're referring to what we refer to as the, the 12 points or the whatever, and it would uh, seem to me that people in the judiciary branch should be subject to um, not misusing government resources and to um, not uh, encouraging others to, to <laughs> I mean, that, that those are broad enough. Those, those didn't have um, a lot of detailed specifics underneath them. So they would just be there. I don't think that there's any requirement that you put that into your, your code. This is the state code of ethics and you have, you have um, something over here, but everybody, everybody who's a public servant would be, would have to not use misgovernment resources, would not have to, would not um, use information received in a, in a manner for their own personal gain or yeah. That's the way I. That's the way I looked at it. The, it's hard to imagine there's anything really objectionable here. I agree with you, Senator. I, just to be clear, at the last meeting last Friday, I think Senator Clarkson, you mentioned a couple times that the the legislation might include these ten to twelve things, and then the the legislation would com contemplate deferring to, for example, to the judiciary to incorporate those items into our codes. Maybe I misunderstood that. Uh, I don't know why you should have to incorporate them. You have your codes. There's this code that's kind of overreaching. Um, I, I think that was before we thought about kind of taking that conflict of interest section and redefining that. Right. Okay. 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 That helps. Well, uh, it's good to get the overview today. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, we'll, again, we're looking at it uh, right here in the moment, but yep. many thanks to the folks who worked hard, it looks like in the last week to, to uh, meet the committee's expectations. Well, that's nice to hear. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to jump. Oh, Amrin, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say from, from a technical perspective of looking at this draft, those, uh, those sections A through G um, would cover all, all public servants in all branches of government. Okay, it, it just as a, yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. I just wanted I just wanted to be clear that the draft, as it is currently written, we removed the exclusions um, from the application of the code of ethics um, up towards the top of the bill, which means all of it would apply. Um, that is how it is written at the moment. So A through G or A through J would apply to judges, lawyers, and all of the other non-judge, non-lawyer uh, employees within the judiciary. That is yes. correct. So if there is a provision that is is current that is in there that is in conflict with what is uh, presently in the judiciary's code of conduct um, with regard to uh, judicial uh, staff, um, then you. I would assume that the judiciary would need to update its code of conduct to align with state law. Right. And so that's unless, unless, uh, certainly unless there are um, per constitutional parameters that would give the judiciary uh, authority to. Um, I know I don't want to wade into much of what has already been waded into before, um, but there has been a lot of discussion about where that constitutional line is. Um, so I will just leave it at at present this covers um, all three branches of government. Yes, but, but I think you've recognized, you know, a, a little bit of a sticking point, not one that we can't work through, but with respect to the, to the employee code of conduct, uh, modifying that uh, within the court administrator's office, we have the ability to do that. That's. But I don't think you have to modify anything. Are there, are there issues in those that, you feel that the judiciary branch should not have to abide by? No, misuse I, of it? No, okay. no, I think just making sure that there's alignment between what we have in our employee code of conduct and what's here, and that there's clarity for our employees <laughs> and for our managers. I don't think that's difficult to do, but you know, we'll wanna, we'll wanna do the alignment. Procedurally, I think uh, you know, there are additional steps that have to be taken. You know, there's, a, there's a process for, the rules of professional responsibility uh, that we we don't want to overlook, and I, I think it will be important for there to be some discussion about that because the the professional responsibility board is charged with making recommendations to the court about the rules of professional conduct, and uh, we'll have to figure out how we work that through. Okay, I. I, I, I might be completely misunderstanding this, but I see we have 12 things here. This is a, an umbrella for the 12 things. You have your own set of procedures under there. You don't have to change anything because if, you're, if you, the professional code of conduct does not include or imply that people shouldn't be using information that they receive for their personal gain, then there's something wrong with the professional code of conduct. So I don't see that you have to do anything because we have we have this umbrella, and then underneath there, the we the each each branch will have some very specific things underneath there, and they will have um, very specific procedures to carry out whether if if somebody is violating them but I, I might be completely wrong here but I, I I can't I can't imagine that there would be any conflict with anything in the judiciary branch or the legislative branch or government attorneys that conflicts yeah. with any of those 12 things or whatever they are however many yeah, yeah I, I suspect you're right and I see Christina shaking her head and I I understand that's certainly the intent uh, but I, I, I want to make sure the folks on our end who are responsible for all of that technical work are yeah. familiar with all of this. So, um, you know, it's a little work on our end, but, uh, but, yeah. but I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, they're sort of foundational. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
I'm going to jump, I think, to John Campbell, because I know you had some concerns about the um, professional code of ethics for or professional regulation for attorneys okay. and also for the post um, uh, employment. employment. And, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, John Campbell, Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And I um, apologize for my voice. You but still you know, sound pretty awful. Yeah, it's still, I think it's like the third day of strep. Oh. So um, it's like razor blades in the throat, but we'll try to get through it. Um, there, uh, again, Madam Chair, I, I just uh, saw this just now. Yeah. I didn't know that they had done another draft. So I'd like to you know, take the time to go through it. Um, one thing I really do think it's important to point out, though, because uh, I believe some people have, have said that um, that uh, the professional co uh, code of ethics the, for the attorneys uh, did not was really more concerned about uh, the attorney client privilege and, and uh, relations between attorneys and clients and not uh, anything about uh, having to do with government, which is not true. I mean, we have a there's a specific section that deals uh, directly with uh, government attorneys. Uh, several, uh, we have uh, several pages of our code of conduct. In fact, actually the conflict of interest is, uh, is very similar uh, to what it's here, but it, we, it is in our um, uh, professional code of responsibility. Um, we do have a conflict of interest policy for government employees. And I believe that actually somebody looks like they may have, have uh, Looked at it when they were uh, drafting. I'm not sure if that if they some of this came, but there are I, there are some differences. But I, I'd like to go through this uh, uh, and it, with more detail to determine if it's a if it's a major conflict. I hate to use that word again, but um, uh, with uh, with what's here, um, I think the changes. I, it's I, it's I, I really appreciate the fact that uh, the committee had did uh, make those changes. Uh, the post employment again without. With just a cursory glance, I think it, it does address the issue, uh, but I'd have to look at it closely. Uh, you have, uh, I believe, somebody representing the VSCAs on the mm -hmm. call, so they probably would be able to uh, to address that and answer that. Uh, but uh, if I could just reserve um, the right to yeah. come back, and uh, if we do find any uh, issues that might be of concern, uh, I'd like to do that. Yes, thank you. And I, I, you're, you're right. And we, everybody did just see this, including all of the committee members and myself and probably Christine. <laughs> Amron is maybe the only one who actually saw it before this. But I, I would encourage us when we, when we look at this to not read this as is written for legislative purposes or for drafting purposes, but to look at this as if we have these 12 12 kind of definitions of what we are all supposed to abide by and then not and and then thinking oh wait a minute can our employees abide by by that and if the answer is no then we need to do some looking at why that answer is no if the answer is yes then the whatever um, codes anybody has underneath there are fine because they're already saying, yes, we can abide by that. So I would just encourage us not to look at, I mean, to look at the way it's drafted, but to, um, in our minds, think of it a little differently. So thank you. The only thing I would say to that is that as always, I think you always want to avoid um, uh, you know, conflicts with, um, with rules or, or especially when you're dealing with ethics uh, rules and uh, ones that might bind you know, that where as with attorneys we're bound under these uh, under the court the Supreme Court so um, we just want to make sure that there's no yep. uh, uh, conflict from within. Just please don't come back and say that the attorneys can't abide by the one that says they shouldn't um, use their information for their per personal gain. <laughs> No, I, I, you know, there's certain ones of these that you think are, are pretty, uh, uh, they would be common sense. And that's why I, I uh, sometimes I look at these and I say, I can't believe we're actually telling somebody that they should not do this. And they, they someone might think it's okay to do. But, um, you know, having spent uh, 16 years in that building and uh, with, along with you all, um, I know that unfortunately there are some people come in and they, um, and I have Pat McDonald's there too. So probably heard some crazy stories along the way, yep. but, uh, 
So I, I, I again, I think it's, uh, you know, I, supporting ethics and, and, you know, cleaning up uh, any type of uh, concerns there are in, in government uh, is always a, a plus in my book. So I will say this, when Senator Campbell was the pro tem, he was very insistent and dragged me down to his office and said, we need to start working on an ethics issue. So... Um, Good people with me. So I, I also want to remind everybody that we have this on the schedule again for next Tuesday at two and would like to be able to, to wrap it up. So if there are issues that anybody comes up with be, between now and then, please try to, I mean, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, not Tuesday, next Wednesday. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Jason, who are you representing? Hi, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you. Members of the committee. Uh, I'm Jason Gramet. I'm uh, representing myself, actually. Oh, good, okay, thank you. So, um, I am the executive director of the Rhode Island Ethics Commission, uh, but oh. I'm, not here. I'm not here on behalf of them. I'm also the past president of the Council on Governmental Ethics, uh, from last year and a member of their governing board, but I'm not here to represent the Council on Governmental Ethics. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, Christina reached out to me and yeah. indicated that members of the committee might want to hear from someone who uh, administers a code of ethics in one of your neighboring New England states. So as part of my civic duty, I thought I would, since I'm not going skiing in Vermont this week like I normally oh. do, oh, thought that I would- that's a gift. That's a gift we can't give you. I know. <laughs> so I think, I, and I knew I recognized your name from someplace and it was from Christina's um, suggestions. So I think what I'm going to do is let others weigh in on this. Um, uh, draft and then and then kind of go to you for some overall. Does that make sense, everybody to to do it that way so that we can hear, so that he, Jason has the chance to hear what people's comments and concerns might be. Sure. Okay, all right. Paul, would you like to join us? Um, you're inviting me to weigh in on the legislation? I am, if you would like to, uh, on, this, to. on this draft. Or and uh, actually, I would first like to just, um, ask, have you and the other members of the committee uh, seen and read the letter from the five uh, ethics commissioners? Yes. Yes. All right, very good. That pretty much sums up what I would have to say, oh. um, except I would just underscore that um, I said five, actually one of our commissioners is currently recused, so four commissioners, um, but the, the four commissioners who are not recused um, we are all of the same mind, as, as I think pretty well expressed in that letter to the committee. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think that we should make it clear that we, our intent always was to, to do that, to get something out this year and to work really hard to get it right. I don't think any of us had any interest in shelving this or um, dragging our feet or anything else, but um, as with all legislation, it goes through lots and lots and lots of muddling and redoing and people thinking through and then finally, hopefully coming to some kind of a resolution. So I just wanted to make that clear that, and I, I think that there was some uh, indication in some media that maybe we weren't even interested, but I think both Senator Polina and I tried to make that very clear that we were. And, and so. we really appreciate the time this committee has devoted to this bill. If I could just make one other little point, I was sure. hoping, hoping and expecting uh, that Paul Gillies would be joining us today at the committee. Um, and there was an invitation to yeah. have him come, um, uh, but he hasn't shown up. I just left him a phone message um, I don't know his whereabouts. I hope he would still be invited next Wednesday 
Uh, I could, if you'd like, I could report on my phone conversation of him from several days ago and his, um, but it would be better to have him show up and explain himself. I, I, we would be happy to have him show up, but what I would want him to do is to, to comment on where we are with the, in the process and with the, uh, the draft of the bill. We know that he, we often use Paul um, for constitutional questions. And I think that we have, um, I, I think Amarin has pretty well um, gotten around what might be considered the constitutional issues here um, by the way she's written this up. But, but he's still welcome to join us if he wants. And I will relay this latest draft to Paul Gillis. Yep. Yeah, we will after, as of today, we will make, this is on our <coughs> website and it'll be available for everybody to, to see, so. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, I'm gonna, oh, thank you, Paul, I'm sorry. You're fine, I'm good. I'm gonna jump to Vince. Are you with us, Vince Aluzi? Hi there, can you hear Hello. me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Ah, yes, now we can see you. Whether it's good or bad, that's the other question. But nice to see you we all. We won't comment. <laughs> it's nice to see you all working hard on a Friday afternoon. When I first started there in the 1980s, by noontime, the place was a ghost town. Things have changed a lot. But anyway, thanks for the opportunity to comment. As you know, we represent over 6,000 individuals who work in all the agencies and departments and entities of state government many of whom are licensed by different professions at the Secretary of State's office, the Medical Practice Board, and uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. The only thought I've had, having seen this draft just a few minutes ago, is that you may wanna consider a delayed implementation date. The reason for that is that I do think, uh, as we've seen with the attorneys, a lot of work has been put in to make sure the bill does not adversely impact the ability of attorneys to do their work and, and, uh, and then represent others should they move on to a different uh, place of employment. In, in, in the case of all of the individual individuals we represent, you know, engineers, scientists, uh, land use experts, they all have their own um, code of ethics, their professional rules of conduct, what I'm thinking is that it might make sense to direct that any uh, profession that is governed by a, a code of conduct take six months to review whether anything needs to change in their own um, governing regulations, and then uh, they would be harmonious and work together. You know, there's, the one thing about attorneys is in this bill, they're represented by the Supreme Court by the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, by VSCA. Who's out there representing the well driller or the engineer that works at A&R or one of the land use experts, uh, people at the Public Service Board? You know, there's just so many professions that may be impacted. It's not that we're against the spirit and the intent of the bill, but I really think there has to be a, a synchronization of the various um, uh, professions, something which the committee was able to do for the attorneys, but something which it's impossible to do for all the others out there. So that's the only suggestion I have. Put it in, you know, pass the bill, have a delayed effective date. It could be January 1, it could be next July, and then um, you won't get any unintended consequences. I think I'll leave it at that at this point. Allison. So Vince, as you know, <clears throat> this bill still has a long way to go before it's enacted. Uh, and uh, it goes to the House next. I mean, if we could put, uh, I, I think the House, you know, we have another month and a half, two months before, you know, of opportunity for people to weigh in on this. So I, I, I instead of anticipating it needs to have a delayed implementation date at the moment, I would encourage every one of those professional groups that has uh, a, 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 a developed code of ethics to review them and be in touch with the House Government Operations Committee. 
I appreciate that, but it's the logistics of it. It's like moving an army. We can't, there's just no way we can do it. We've seen um, you move that army. Well, <laughs> that would be Steve Howard, but he spends a lot yeah, of time well, at Carlyle. Yeah. He spends a lot so, of time at Carlyle, so it's hard for me to, to say that we can do that. So I, I understand this. My, my first reaction is that my guess is that they won't need to, most people, most professions won't need to make any changes at all because this is the umbrella. This doesn't dictate any detail to them. And the only thing that I think might, might impact some of the professions out there is the post employment government employment. Mm -hmm. If, if, and, and I, it, it seems to me that the way it's written now is it's very clear. So if you had somebody working for, um, DEC and they were involved in a particular permit, then they should not leave and within a year go represent the person who is now applying for the permit if they were the personally involved. And, right. and I'm not sure that we need to delay that for I'm, I have no problems delaying it until January. I wouldn't delay it after past January, but mm -hmm. I well, the I, mean, I, I think that that is common sense right now that they shouldn't they shouldn't be doing that. Well, the committee really has moved mountains for the attorneys. We're glad you did because we represent all the deputy state's attorneys. But I can see if we opened up every individual code of conduct for these various professions, we might have some more questions. And it might be. Well, just we don't questions. have. I don't think they have to open up their code of conduct because this is really just an umbrella, but I'm, I'm not opposed to, le to um, delaying it until January 23rd, which would give also give the ethics commission time to write it up in a nice little poster that everybody can read. And um, so anyway, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Ben, I'm gonna jump to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, members of the committee for the record, Ben Kinsley, uh, Campaign for Vermont. Um, I think uh, like everyone sort of still digesting the, uh, the draft that's in front of us, uh, I think there's um, certainly some positive changes in terms of clarity in here. It's much more clear and I appreciate the, the amount of work that the, the members of the committee have put in over the past week, as well as uh, Amarin and uh, everyone else that's been involved. I think uh, it's definitely um, apparent that there's been a lot of thought put into this, uh, and uh, you can you can tell from the the clarity in the in the draft that we've got in front of us, like uh, um, how much thought has gone into it. So I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, like some some others, I would want a little bit extra time to digest certain pieces of this. I think particularly the the piece around. Um, the the process the recusal process for conflict of interest and how that um, how that interplays I think we would want to think through some of the the scenarios of, of what that might actually look like if um, each branch has a separate um, uh, process for recusal um, I, you know I don't inherently disagree with that but I just think we want to we would want to think through um, to make sure we understand how that would play out in practice. Um, but, uh, but I do appreciate the committee's work in getting a set of standards that apply to all three branches of government. I think that is productive. Um, and, uh, and I think it's also clear in the draft language um, that, that it does not preclude any branch uh, from having a, a policy, uh, HR, or professional code of conduct, or what have you, that is more strict than the rules being uh, contemplated here. It's pretty clear the way that this is drafted. It's meant to be an overarching set of principles. Um, so I, I appreciate the, uh, the work that's been put into this and, um, would also ask that we have a chance to comment next week if we, as we dive in further, if there's anything that we, that we notice, but I think this is a great step. Thank you. Pat, did you have anything to add? Madam Chair, for the record, um, I'd like to just echo, um, what Ben has said. Um, I'm the uh, president of the board of directors of Campaign for Vermont. And we also do our show Vote for Vermont. So we're out there on the politics, small t. Um, I think what the draft that I'm seeing now is making me feel really good. And I compliment the committee. And I want to thank you for allowing Ben and I 
to, to be part of this. The only thing that's still sticking in the back of my mind, and I want to read the language, is the concern about, and I don't want to open up a, <laughs> but I'm going to jump into it. The okay. writing to write why you think you have a conflict of interest. I know there was some there was some concerns from the committee members about if I have a if I have a conflict and want to recuse myself, I I have to fill out the form that uh, made sense to me. I think. Um, Christina submitted it to the committee, but there was still some angst about that. And I just want to make sure as we go forward and you go, if this passes, goes onto the floor, that everybody's comfortable with that particular part of the process. But I think we have made giant strides here and I really compliment you and the committee. And I want to thank uh, Christine and TJ, especially that we've worked very closely together, the four of us, and it's it's been a pleasure. So thank you. Thank you. So Christina, thank you for um, bearing with us. No, thank you. I mean, I I want to echo what everyone else has said. Like, I really appreciate the hard work that has gone into this. You know, this is my first time really lurking, working with the legislature. I didn't realize it was unusual to meet weekly <laughs> and how much work that is for you all just on this one bill. So uh, thank you for that. And I agree, I'm feeling really good about this draft. I think there are perhaps a couple of areas that we might wanna have a bit more discussion um, just in terms of like recent changes, but I do think that we can get through them. Um, I'd like to make an offer to John Campbell. I'm happy to talk um, through how the conflict of interest issue in terms of how it impacts attorneys, how the commission sees it. So we can come to some clarity on that because I think it's always better that if we're all, we're all on the same page. Um, if Mr. Luzzi, I just wanted to um, clarify that the representation restrictions that are in the current code are actually not new. They weren't modified for attorneys specifically. They were just rewritten to be more clear and they track the federal code of ethics. So the DOJ, but also the Department of Labor. And so in terms of you know changing them specifically to address the concerns of attorneys, that, that's not something that's happened. It was just rewritten for clarity. Um, I think as we go forward, you might have a couple more conversations just in terms of how the rules for professional conduct interact with the code of ethics in the sense that when we're talking about the rules of professional conduct for attorneys, so they are mainly focused on the attorney client relationship. I think even if you look at the, the section that's on government attorneys, it mainly addresses you know, clients and past clients, whereas the code of ethics addresses situations that might not be related or mostly do not relate to that relationship. For example, you're an attorney, you work for the agency of transportation, you're putting on a hiring committee. It turns out your brother-in-law is applying for a position that is a conflict of interest for you that does not fall directly under the rules of professional conduct. It would fall under the code of ethics. So you'd follow the procedures in that case for recusing yourself under the code of ethics. For example, you're a prosecutor. Um, you are assigned to prosecute a case. You find out it's your roommate. Um, well, you find out that it's somebody that you know. So under the rules of professional conduct, you might recuse yourself under the rules of professional conduct, but you wouldn't need to under the code of ethics. So it's very rare that the two would intersect. So I fully support the idea of following the recusal process for conflicts that fall under the rules of professional conduct. I don't think there's a question about that. And then there's the other question of when you have a conflict that falls solely under the code of ethics is the rule is the board of professional responsibility set up to handle all these other types of conducts of conflicts do they really want to see you know 300 more types of conflicts come before them that weren't coming before them six months ago so i'll leave it there because i think there are people who are better experts than me like jason to address this issue but i just thought i'd raise those two points so um i think that uh yeah and i think that two we Jason, I want to make good use of your time, and it is um, probably just as late on Friday afternoon in Rhode Island as it is in Vermont. I think we're in the same time zone. So um, if you would like to weigh in here and just give us some, some of your um, knowledge, that would be great. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. And it's your time, and I'm happy to, to give it. I'm only here to help you, so you can take or leave my comments and, and opinion. I don't have any stake in the matter. Uh, just trying to be helpful to the committee to the extent I can be. Um, so I, I've already mentioned uh, you know, who, who I am um, working at the Rhode Island Ethics Commission where I, I've worked there for over 20 years now. Uh, so just to give you a little background, the Rhode Island Ethics Commission was established in 1986. Um, so it's been around for a little over 35 years. 
Um, it does have jurisdiction over all three branches of government and municipal government. So we do it all um, over there, which I, I recognize you're not trying to do municipal government uh, in Vermont. Um, and so I, I've reviewed the, the bill that you have and, and uh, with the changes you also have here. Um, I, I guess I, I will just point out a, a couple of things that struck me as being maybe a little unusual, mm -hmm. but every state's different. So, you know, every state might have a different code of ethics and, and I understand that. Um, the, as to the issue of, of um, uh, attorneys and other licensed professionals, um, in, in Rhode Island, we wouldn't treat them any differently than every other public servant. And my experience uh, with other ethics commissions across the United States and Canada, for that matter, is that would be un a, a bit unusual. And, and in my opinion, probably not necessary. Um, the attorneys do have to follow the rules of professional conduct. Um, and it's the judiciary that normally has disciplinary counsel that handles those matters. But government attorneys, attorneys who are state employees, um, generally follow the same rules that every other state employee follows. And uh, if they violate the code of ethics, then it's whatever the enforce, I'm not sure what the Vermont enforcement mechanism is going to be, whether it will be the ethics commission or some other investigative agency. Um, but it wouldn't be the courts bar disciplinary council that would try to enforce the code of ethics. I assume that that's not the case here either, um, just as the ethics commission wouldn't try to enforce the attorney's rules of professional conduct. Um, you know, real estate agents also have, or engineers or nurses at the Department of Health, they're all licensed people who have rules of ethics that they have to follow for their professions. But they also, in most states, um, in my experience, have to follow the code of ethics for state employees. And there's really not a lot of confusion. Um, you know, it's kind of a Venn diagram, two circles, like the Olympic rings. And, you know, one of those circles is the rules of professional conduct for your whatever you do. And the other is the code of ethics for public employees. And there might be a little bit of overlap here and there. The same conduct might violate both principles, but there's plenty that it only violates one or the other. So I, I just throw that out there for your information. Um, um, and uh, the, I guess the other thing that I would, I, I would say, two things. First, I give this committee a lot of credit. Um, I've written lots of ethics laws and regulations in my 20 years. It's always difficult. Uh, it's hard to, to legislate on ethics, and, and I, I give you a lot of credit for the time and work you've put into it. Um, but it is, it is worth doing, um, even if you don't get it perfect. <laughs> you know, you, you, you get these laws on the books. They can always be revisited later. It's uh, perfect is the enemy of good enough in, in, in ethics. Uh, sometimes you just need to get something on the book. So um, I would encourage you there. And, and the last thing I would say about, about your uh, proposed code of ethics is uh, from an outsider looking in, I, I, I think it might be valuable for you to know that it is a modest code of ethics. Um, for instance, the Rhode Island code of ethics is much stricter on almost every one of those A through J um, provisions that you've got. That's not to say the years are bad or that it needs to be stricter. I just want you to have, and, and, and many other states have even stricter uh, provisions there also. So I don't, although when you go from zero to something, of course it seems very strict, right? But, but if you look across the country, um, I think you will find that this is a, a very modest proposal, a good and modest proposal at regulating ethics for public servants. And so I, I encourage you to go forward. And if you need to strengthen them later, you can always do that. Or if you need to lighten them. Um, I want my time here to be valuable. If you have any questions for me or any, anything you would like me to address, I'm happy to do it. And if you don't, I will not feel the least bit offended, but uh, I'm at your service. So committee, I, I have a question. Um, if I might, unless other committee members would like to jump in. Mm -hmm. Okay, you I'm going to first. Uh, so I, um, I just going back to Christina's last um, statement about the 
And I think that one of the areas that has been uh, caused the most angst is the conflict of interest area. That, that seems to be where, where people are the most concerned, including myself. So the, the idea that, that I, I totally agree with the, the kind of the definition there of conflict of interest. I mean, it's not really a definition, but what it means and that you shouldn't, you shouldn't have a conflict of interest or a perceived conflict of interest. You should avoid that. But then when I go to the procedure, I, I have mixed feelings about how that procedure applies to everybody. And how do you, if you have a similar kind of procedure in Rhode Island, how do your legislators deal with that? If I have to, the way we deal with a conflict of interest is if we're voting, we say, we stand up and say under rule 71, I'm going to excuse myself from voting because I may have a conflict of interest. And then the body says, we don't think you do. We don't think it's enough of a conflict for you to be recused from voting. And that's the way we handle it. Um, so I, we don't write anything down. We don't justify why we uh, do it. Or if we wanted to keep on and somebody else said, I think you have a conflict of interest, the body would decide. So I just am curious how in Rhode Island you deal with that with your legislators when they're voting. Sure. So what the issue of, of legislators and whether they have to recuse when there's a conflict of interest. So I'm sure as all of you on the committee know, there is legislative immunity written into your constitution. I don't know if you call it the speech and debate clause in Vermont, but every state and the federal government has something that says, mm -hmm. You can't question legislators any place but the legislature or their core legislative acts. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so it may be that 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 it's that for legislators, it's not really uh, up to the ethic. You know, the, the conflict of interest procedures maybe don't apply there. Then maybe the legislature gets to set its own recusal type rules due to legislative immunity that's written into the Vermont Constitution. Rhode Island had that also, by the way, until 2016, when the people voted to amend the state constitution to specifically put legislators under the authority of the Ethics Commission and the Code of Ethics. That's the only state in the country I know of that does that. And I'm not suggesting that's about to happen in Vermont. So for, for legislators, it may be that you, that you don't, have to follow that specific conflict of interest procedure written in the, the code of ethics. But all of the other things don't really relate to core legislative acts, gifts, revolving door, post employment yeah, yeah. restrictions, use of content. So you follow all those. That, that would be the normal course that, that the legislature maybe gets to come up with its own recusal provision, but it has to follow everything else. Um, but really the legislature and, and, conceivably a judge sitting in a case might have that type of leeway to, to under separation of powers principles. But beyond that, but even the judges should still follow the gift rules and the, the use of confidential information rules and ev everything else, because it doesn't have to do with the judicial function. It just has to do with being a government employee. Well, I think that's the way this is written, that it, everybody has to abide by everything. The only thing that's excused for anybody is the recusal process. That's the only thing in here that doesn't apply to everybody. Well, and then the post-employment issues when, when you're talking about attorneys, I mean, I'll tell you how we handled that in Rhode Island. Oh, okay. We, we just said, this doesn't apply to appearances before a court of record. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, a matter of public record in a court of law. So that pretty much satisfies all of the attorneys. Their post-employment restrictions don't ever prohibit them from going to court in a, in a matter of, in, in, a, in a court issue. And that's really what the lawyers are concerned with, we found. But, it, but it, they shouldn't be able to, a lawyer for your Department of Transportation, I don't know, if, um, shouldn't be able to quit today 
and then tomorrow start representing some giant bridge engineering firm back before the Department of Transportation. At least in Rhode Island, you can't do that. Um, but if they want to go work for that same company and represent them in court, that would be okay. Oh, okay, that's, okay. That's how we handle that in Rhode Island. Yeah. Thank you. Allison? So Jason, thanks. Um, it's helpful. It's always good to hear another perspective here. Vermont is modest in many ways, so maybe our code of ethics is perfectly complementary to the rest of Vermont. Uh, but what I I am concerned, having had a a, a child uh, as a, a young a person who could conceivably be an intern or a clerk, uh, who only has limited employment, is trained basically doing like a residency in in our legislative branch, uh, in our legislative council. I am concerned that we solve this problem because it would, to me, it's grossly unfair to limit them mm -hmm. uh, if they're only working for us for a short, either as an intern while they're at law school or as a clerk for a one year period. To limit them, uh, I think is a little challenging given they're desperate to get a job after they finish their work with us. How, how do you handle those? Uh, with all the provisions of our code and, and of many codes apply to everyone who's an employee. If, 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 if under the personnel rules, you're considered a full-time or part-time or seasonal employee, then it, then it would apply. But as I read through your proposed code, I don't really see any, anything that would stop them from, as I said, your post-employment restrictions are fairly modest in that it seems right. like they're only limited to matters that they worked on while they while, were- right. While they were there. You know, in, in Rhode Island, you can't represent anyone back before your own agency for a year on anything, whether you get paid or don't get paid. So wow. that's what I mean when I say your proposal is pretty modest. Got right? it. Um, so that that restriction to say, I mean, obviously you shouldn't be working on a on some matter, and then when you leave, come back and represent a private party back on that exact same matter, I, that seems to be what your restriction is. And that seems pretty reasonable, even for a clerk or an intern. It, it doesn't seem that onerous to me. And that's that's why we put in a few years ago, we put in the um, lobbying prohibition that legislators couldn't become a lobbyist uh, within a year. Right. Yeah. Any other questions for, um, Jason, thank, thank you for coming in. I realize this is modest, but as you said, if you're going from zero to something, that- I don't mean modest in a dumb. bad way. It's great to, to, for you to actually, to go from nothing to something is probably the hardest part. And so yeah. I don't discount the work and the effort it takes to do this. Allison? Sorry, I just, I'm just curious because uh, I know there are lots of states that have a very strong code of ethics and have lots of ethical challenges that we read about in the paper. So I'm just curious, how many cases do you get? You have enforcement powers, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. And yeah, so how many cases a year you get in front and how does it break down between the branches of government, municipal, executive, legislative, and judiciary? I'd be curious to know. So those are great questions. Um, first of all, we have more cases that involve the cities and towns than involve okay. state officials. Um, you know, there's just a lot less scrutiny in the cities and towns. Each city and town, though, still has multi-million dollar budgets and lots of jobs to give away and, and things to do. So, so it makes sense that, that we see a lot more cases come from there. As, as far as the overall number, you know, I there might be, um, 30 or 40 complaints that get filed a year. Um, the majority of them, uh, you know, don't go all the way. Um, you know, the, they might get dismissed along the way or they, they were unfounded to start with. Um, th there are some big ones that occasionally happen, but our philosophy, and, and I think this is the philosophy of most good ethics commissions is the, the value of the ethics commission isn't enforcing the code of ethics. It's just that it exists, it, that, it, that once the rules are there, most public officials follow the rules. 
It's, it's just creating a set of standards. Most people are honest, and when they know what the rules are, they will follow them. So it creates just kind of a, a culture, whereas when there are no rules, there's kind of a vacuum, and people don't know that what they're doing is, is maybe not, has an appearance of impropriety, because in a lot of places, we've always done it this way. So how can it have an appearance of impropriety? That's how we've been doing it for 70 years and over here. So having a code sets those rules. The enforcement, sure, you have to do some enforcement, but the training, the education uh, to, to go out and, and, and teach people what these rules are on a recurring and regular basis is, is the key. And so if that, I'm, if I may, Madam Chair, have a follow-up. Yep. So that's a, an interesting question at this point in time, isn't it? Because that is resources and that's money. And who do and and who do we charge with that training and, and that? I mean, each branch should be responsible for that. And and you know, that's a, a resource question. And we have, I guess, the opportunity here with this to apply those resources or or we wait and see and apply them later. But I think if training and education are so important to set this culture code, I mean to set this standard and to at least uh, communicate that it exists. Um, it would be, and maybe you could think about it. But if you might send set us send us maybe what you do for it, as a standard for training and education in state government and municipal government, that would be helpful because we're going to have to resource this at some point. Well, yeah, and, and I think that we do have it in there that they there has to be training and we've we've heard that about 85 percent of ethics um enforcement or compliance is around education but and about 15 don't have money is around um enforcement. Don't have money. so um i think that yeah i i i didn't even think about the idea of resources because it's been charged the commission in here has charged different bodies for to provide that training well, you can think about it in terms of, you know, I, I see you've got about six or seven different entities that are that are allowed to give the trainings, uh, maybe five or six under yours. Um, each one might give a slightly different training. Some might know the code better than others. Some might focus on, in, in Rhode Island, we leave it to the Ethics Commission. We have one person who, uh, that's their job, to train all state employees at, to develop online training modules to make it more cost-effective and efficient, um, to do Zoom trainings at places. Uh, that's the general model. You'll find that most established ethics commissions have an education coordinator or someone whose job it is is to think about training all the time. And it, you know, it's so it's one more state employee in state government versus five or six spread out at five different agencies that that may or may not have the same level of expertise. Something to think about. Here, here we wouldn't add anybody to those five or six because we would just pile it on top of somebody else's <laughs> job. And the addition of one person here is always um, fodder for a fight. But um, it is an interesting idea that there be a single person at the Ethics Commission that is responsible for education and training. And I can certainly support that before I would ever go to enforcement. I mean, I, yeah, I think I, that that's, that is something to consider. Yeah, and I bet Christina is thinking, oh, she'd like that too. <laughs> I mean, we would like to work with the different branches to come up with a baseline training, and then it uh -huh. can always be modified according to you know, any special provisions, anything that they have that exceeds the code of ethics, but to come up you know, together, put our heads together and come up with one, one oh. online based baseline Good. training. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe you can get an intern to help you create that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments or concerns? And then I think that um, I, Christina, do you want to make any general comments here? And then I think that the, the one that we'll hear from different people about the, oh, first of all, thank you, Jason, so much for taking time out of your day. Um, and I hope you're having better weather than we are. Not really a big windstorm, but thank you. Yeah. Keep, keep, yeah, keep up Senator Rom Hinsdale is 
having huge winds up there and she's looking around right now hoping the trees don't fall on her it was house. winds yesterday it was a flood alert today that said like don't leave your house and oh. now everything's really icy and heavy so i don't want anyone to worry at at home in chinon county but okay not, not a great um, scene. <laughs> and, and the power is still on yeah so um, uh, Christina, do you want to make a few basic comments? And then I think that what we'll do is here next Wednesday from try to get everything pulled together. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Polina. Yeah, well, this might be, um, I saw I was muted. This might be a way for, to, for Chris, uh, like take off for Christina to make some comments. But just in plain English, um, when we look at this new draft, how have we overcome the dilemmas that we were facing with just Sherry and the lawyers? Like what's, what, 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 why is this different, this draft, in terms of helping us achieve the, what we were trying to do in terms of the lawyers and the judiciary? Christina, do you wanna? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize you're talking to me. Yeah, yeah well, I think that we've come to an agreement. Yeah, I think we've come to the agreement that these are you know, the baseline principles that apply to everyone and that the questions that we're left with are actually pretty narrow and they may be really procedural questions. Um, I do think that, you know, when you're looking at the, we're looking at the requirements that are already in place for ethical conduct of attorneys and judges and other professionals, they really do, they really are already in line with this. Um, there, it just may be situations where the application is a bit different. So, you know, it might be written a bit differently in the code of professional conduct, and it might apply, you know, more to attorneys and clients versus, you know, it's written a bit differently in the code of ethics. Um, and it applies to situations where, you know, your brother is in the next office, right? So that's a bit of a different situation, but the principles are really the same. You're just, you know, you're acting in good faith. You're, you know, acting in, you know, a way that enhances the public trust. So I do think that we just managed to narrow it down to a very few, few points that are outstanding that I do think that we can work through with just a little bit more conversation. And like I said, I'm very happy to reach out to John Campbell or anyone else who has testified in the past just to talk through that section and talk through like the actual impact when we're talking about conflict of interest. What does it mean when you know, you're an attorney and you're faced with a situation where you're in a lawsuit versus you're an attorney working on a policy issue and somebody uh, gives you, offers you tickets? Uh, to attend an event and it may look like a conflict of interest. So those are two different situations. So just getting some clarity amongst ourselves about how it would actually work in real life. I think that's that's the last the last step into really moving forward. So are we are we saying that are we saying that judiciary and the lawyers would act uh, would in those instances act sorry I'm losing my voice would in those those instances use their own code rely on their own code in order to decide what to do? I think it depends on situations. So I think if you're talking about the attorney-client relationship uh, litigation, so the the rules of professional conduct, those, you know, are really developed around those situations. So very clearly in those case, those cases, they'd be following those rules because the code of ethics wouldn't be implicated. You wouldn't, right. follow, you don't need to follow the code of ethics because you wouldn't actually arise, you know? We're not talking about, you know, if you represented, you know, a real estate firm last year and now you're in state government, that doesn't come into the code of ethics necessarily in terms of conflict of interest. It only comes up, the, comp the code of ethics comes up in situations where, like I mentioned, like you're attending an event, you're going to get a gift. You might be looking at a situation where you're trying to hire your roommate for a position. And those are just, you know, two different situations with two different applicable sets of rules. Okay. And, and judges the same thing. The, if, if a, I mean, it, it seems to me that everybody should be covered under the, the gift policy. If, you, if somebody gives you a gift to influence your decision, that, that's bad, <laughs> no matter who you are. So I, I don't see that there's a, um, except for the procedures around conflict, I don't see that there's any reason why everybody shouldn't be abiding by this conflict of interest. I mean, by this code of ethics. But we do say that there's nothing to keep them from having something that's stricter or in, in addition to, to the code well, of ethics. Yeah, yeah. And they, and they will because they will have different circumstances. Like Christina pointed out, the professional code of regulations will, we're not, we're not addressing how their uh, client attorney privileges are here. 
that's that's their specific thing. So they will have to have different and different codes for different things that are specific to though them. Got it. I think. So any anybody else want to weigh in? Brian, you've been very quiet. Well, Madam Chair, I liken this to, uh, in many ways, a house of cards. And I didn't want to say anything or make any suggestion that might displace one card and have the potential of having it all fall down. So I've been just very carefully listening. And uh, I like what we've come up with. Let, let's just say that. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Anybody else have any? Parting words of wisdom or non-wisdom? Oh, I look forward to next week. So I, I really want to um, give, thank Amarin and Christina. I know I have been a real pain in the side on this bill. And I want to thank them for bearing with me and um, uh listening to my rants no thank you i'm i'm so happy that we've gotten to this place it was a lot of work but i think it's really worth it and like you said you know having this in place is really going to enable us to go forward with the training which is going to be you know the most important part so thank you for all of your hard work everyone and christina i noted that you said that had not having done legislation before you didn't realize that it was going to mean you were going to have to be before us every week and we do this on everything so remember if you don't want to do this don't introduce a new bill again next year <laughs> all right everybody are we set and we will come back we have this on the schedule did i say next wednesday i think at two